Now, the deity of Christ is one of the most important and attack doctrines of the faith. You cannot be saved unless you get this thing right about the deity of Christ. Now, I'm not saying you have to have it, you know, just picture perfect. But the bottom line is, look, Romans 10, 9 says, that If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Lord means boss. All right, you've got to meet, you got to believe that Jesus is the boss, the master of the universe. All right, he's God of the universe. You have to believe that in order to be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, just listen as I read John 8, 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. If you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Believe not that Jesus is who? Lord. You've got to believe Jesus is Lord. All right? <clears throat> now, the deed of Jesus Christ has always been an attack and is evidenced by uh, a lot of the manuscripts, but it's really been evidenced lately in the last several hundred years with just the different cults that have surfaced, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, some of these different cults that have risen in the last couple hundred years that really attacked the deity of Jesus Christ. But the deity of Jesus Christ has been under attack long before that. All right? even, even it's evidenced in some of the early manuscripts that even there was early groups 2,000 years ago, you know, that were attacking the deity of Jesus Christ. Like, for example, the, the King James, one of the reasons why we believe the King James Bible is the, the only uh, preserved word of God for the English-speaking people is because it comes from the Textus Receptus, sort of received text. Now, these godly scholars uh, that uh, King James appointed to give us our English, authorized English version of the Bible, they gathered all these ancient manuscripts up together. Basically, put them, on, put them on the table. From what I understand, they had, they, they basically, King James gave them seven years to do nothing but just give us a, a good, quality, trustworthy English version of the Bible. They gathered all these manuscripts together and sorted through them. And they said, okay, these 95, this stack of 95% agree with one another. This 5%, we're going to cast it aside because there's contradictions. We don't agree. This does not, this 5% does not agree with the majority. All right, so they cast it aside. Well, the King James comes from the majority text. The King James comes from the 95%. That other little 5% is what a lot of the modern perversions come from. All right, and that's why a lot of these modern perversions are weak on the deity of Jesus Christ because those 5% were tainted from early groups like Jehovah's Witnesses and people who would tamper with and taint the Word of God through the influence and power of Satan. So we know that the deed of Jesus Christ is, has been, uh, is, is a doctrine that's been attacked for thousands of years, and it's still being attacked today. And you can always identify a cult by how they believe about this issue. All right, How they believe on the issue of the deity of Christ is a, uh, is a telltale sign of a cult. Jesus Christ was God in flesh. And anything else is heresy and not true to historical Christianity in the Bible. That's the bottom line. All right? <clears throat> Jesus had to be both God and man to bridge the gap. There's a great gulf between God and man. All right? Of, as a result of sin. Now, in order for, for uh, Jesus to bridge the gap, he had to be 100% man and take a hold of man, and he had to be 100% God and take a hold of God and bridge that gap. That's why he's our mediator. If he wasn't God in the flesh, then his death on the cross meant nothing. All right? <clears throat> he had to be God in flesh to make the final payment for sin. Now, this is a vital doctrine from which we must mark those who do not believe and have no fellowship with them. Now, what I mean, have no fellowship with them, that doesn't mean you can't sit with your great uncle at the family reunion who's a Jehovah's Witness. That's not what I'm talking about, all right? But what you shouldn't do is you shouldn't call him a brother. And you shouldn't go to one of his Bible studies or, you know what, matter of fact, you shouldn't even let Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons in your house. Don't even let him in your house. They come knocking on your door. I'm not saying you got to be rude and unkind to them or nothing. You know, witness to them. Witness to them. But don't let them in your house. And here's the reason why. They will use it as a tactic 
to convert your neighbor. They'll go to your neighbor's door, knock on your neighbor's door and say, man, I just had an awesome Bible study with Brother Manley. Would you mind if I come into your house? And they'll use it, they'll use it against you. Don't let them into your home. The Bible's clear about that. All right, don't call them brother and don't go to their ec no ecumenical gatherings. That's one of the major problems with this two two, uh, together 2016 Back when I was coming up, it was the Promise Keepers. You notice it, it, every, every generation's got kind of a new name. But it's these ecumenical gatherings where everybody gathers together in the name of Jesus and they forget all their doctrinal differences. And, they, you know, they want Catholics to come together, Baptists, Mormons. We all come together. We all call one another brother. No, that's not what the Bible says. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Come out from among them. Now, uh, I don't know if you got enough fingers, but maybe you can hold your place in Isaiah. <laughs> And uh, and first, where did I tell you? First John. Hold your place there. Turn to First Timothy three sixteen. While you're turning to First Timothy three sixteen, let me read to you from Second John chapter one verse nine through ten. Now here's the clear cut teachings from the Bible about why we should not fellowship with people who don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Again, I'm not saying uh, you can't, you know. Like we've got one of our church, or somebody comes to our church, their mother is a Mormon. Well, they're going to love their mother, they're going to honor their mother, they're going to respect their mother. That's not what I'm talking about. Again, I'm not talking about not going to the family re re reunion and sitting with your great uncle who's Jehovah's false witness. That's not what I'm talking about. There's a difference between, you know, a mandatory, you know, something like that that may be mandatory than, uh, you know, going to a cookout with a bunch of Mormons. You know, you see what I'm, I think you understand what I'm saying. Listen to 2 John chapter 1, verse 9 through 10. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that abideth, I'm sorry, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So when you're, you know, calling these Jehovah's Witnesses and people brother and letting them into your house, you're actually partaking in their evil deeds. You're actually bidding them Godspeed. You're actually encouraging them. All right, so we need to be careful not to do any of that kind of stuff. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, Preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. This is clear that this is talking about Jesus. This is one of the greatest Bible verses here to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. That God was manifest in the flesh. He was preached unto the Gentiles. Who was preached unto the Gentiles? Jesus Christ. Who has been believed on in the world? Jesus Christ. Who was received up in the glory? Jesus Christ. Whoever that was, whoever that was that was preached to the Gentiles, whoever that, whoever that was that was believed on in the world and received up in the glory. He was God. Okay, God come in the flesh. Now turn to John 5, 7. Now, no doubt, there's no doubt or no... What it says here, without controversy, greatest mystery of godliness. What it's saying here is there's no, there's no controversy about it. There's no question about it. There's no doubt about it. This thing about the Trinity, this thing about Jesus Christ being God in flesh is a mystery. There's no question about it. We don't try to say it's not a mystery. It's, it's somewhat hard to understand. But here's the deal. The Internet's hard to understand. I don't understand how you can punch into a Google machine and have all this vast knowledge available to you. And the thing that boggles me, it never fills up. It never stops up. It seemed like after a while, I mean, how, I mean, it seems like to me after a few million YouTube videos, something would jam up somewhere. It would just <laughs> fill up. How does that work? And I don't think, if you think you got it, understand, if you, I don't, it, you may think you understand it, but you really don't understand it. You may think you have it all figured out, but you really don't have it all figured out. You're like me. You don't understand it all, but you just use it. You just believe it. You just punch whatever you need to into that Google machine, and it comes up. It's just like, man, you can explain to me all day long how electricity works. But the bottom line is it's a mystery. 
The bottom line is the internet's a mystery. But guess what? I walk in the house, I flip the switch, and the light comes on because I just believe it. I don't understand. It'll always be a mystery. That internet thing will always be a mystery to me, but I believe it because I, I know it works. The same thing with the Trinity. The Trinity is always going to be a mystery to us, but we just believe it because that's what the Bible says. Amen? Our minds cannot fully understand it, and then we'll never be able to fully understand it. But the bottom line is God's Word teaches it. That settles it. I believe it. Now, here's how I explain it. I'll explain to, I'll give you my explanation of the Trinity. The Trinity ties together with the deity of Christ, all right? So I'm kind of meshing these two together a little bit here. But uh, <clears throat> let me explain it to you here. First, let's see what Trinity means. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. All right, these three are one. Now, put your finger there. Hold your finger and turn to Isaiah 4. I think you're probably already in Isaiah 43. If you're not, you can go and turn to Isaiah 43. And while you're turning there, let me explain this three-in-one issue. It's not biblically correct to say, and I've heard this all my life, the Trinity is three separate entities, but one God, or three separate persons, but one God. That's not biblical. And that, confused, that, that makes it even more confusing. All right, because they say, well, how can three, separ how can three separate persons be one. Never said three separate persons. It says three in one. All right. Now, if we're made in the image of God, does, does the Bible say we're made in the image of God? Made in the likeness of God? Okay. If we're three in one and we're made in his image, then he has to be similar to us or we could not be made in his image. So God is similar to us in this nature of being three in one. When you look at me, you're looking at a, a trinity. I'm not claiming to be God or anything like that. I'm just saying I'm created in the image of God. I'm created in a, I'm a triune being. Okay, because look, think about it. When you're looking at me, you see three. You see my flesh. You see, you see, you see, a, 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 you see one person, but this one person is made up of three. He's made up of a flesh, a body. He's made up of a soul. And he's made up of a spirit. But how many manlies is it? It's one. And these three can be separate of one another. Just like God's three in one, and they, God's three can be separate of one another. You know, when I die, you walk up to my casket, my coffin, you're going to see my shell. But my soul and my spirit are going to be separate from one another. They're going to be separate from my body. They're going to be in heaven. Okay, you could look and say, there's manly down on the earth, but in heaven, they're also saying, here's manly in heaven. So there's three in one. Same way God is. All right, God's three in one. Jesus was God's flesh. God the Father in heaven was the soul. And the Holy Spirit is that which is on earth, which dwells in our hearts. So there's three in one. We'll never understand it, but that's what the Bible teaches. And I think that's the clearest explanation for it. We're, we're made in a triune uh, state, just like, like God is in a triune, a triune, triune being, if you would, please. All right, now let's get into it here. How, let's get into the Trinity, I mean the deity of Jesus Christ here. The deity of Jesus Christ is proved by his names in the Bible. Jesus' names in the Bible prove that he is God. All right, 1 John 5, 20. This is a very important one. 1 John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true, even His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Can it get any clearer that Jesus is the true God? Jesus is eternal life. Could it be any clearer? That's a passage of scripture that's really overlooked a lot. People don't even, a lot of people don't even realize it's there that actually teaches Jesus is the true God. Now, Isaiah 43, 11, <clears throat> We see the deity of Jesus Christ is proved by the names of Jesus. He's actually called the true God. That ain't good enough for you. 
All right, let's look at his, is, is he not referred to as the Savior? Jesus is also referred to as the Savior. Now, uh, listen to Isaiah 43, 11. Remind you, this is the Old Testament before Jesus Christ ever came to earth. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So how many Saviors are there? One. Turn to Titus, chapter 1. Hold your place in Isaiah. Don't lose that, because we're going to be coming back. Go to the T-books of the Bible. If you can just find kind of the T-books in the New Testament, you can work your way to Titus. Titus is the last T-book. Uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. It says clear as day in the New Testament, Jesus is the Savior. The Old Testament said in Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So if there's one Savior in the Old Testament, and His name is revealed to us in the New Testament, it's Jesus. Jesus was the Savior of the Old Testament. Amen. Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Uh, Titus 2.10 will tell you the same thing. Titus 3, 4, and 6. There's a whole bunch of verses I could give you that call Jesus Savior, but we just we don't have time to go into all of them. These verses say that both God and Jesus is our Savior. How many Saviors are there? One Savior. Amen. Jesus said in John 10, verse 30, I am a Father and one. When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is God. He's God the Son. All right? And I think it's pretty cool how in the, uh, when it talks about Savior in the King James, have you ever noticed how Savior in the King James spelled with seven letters? I think it's pretty cool because anybody can be a Savior. S-A-V-I-O-R. Uh, Brother Gabriel used to be a police officer. You know, so he, he could have been a, a, he could have easily been a savior. You know, he could have easily save somebody's life. But I like the way that King James spells it. Not with six letters, but seven letters. Because there's only one perfect le- savior. And, and I don't know what I'm saying that this is inspired that way. But I do believe it's pretty cool how in the King James, savior is spelled with seven letters. S-A-V-I-O-U-R. Because there's, a, there's only one savior of the soul. That's Jesus Christ. And it's spelled with seven letters because could it be that that's a reference to his deity? Seven is uh, the number of perfection. Okay, we know there's only one perfect Savior. I'm not saying that's inspired that way. I, know, I understand that's the way they spelled it in uh, the King James English. But I think it's pretty cool that Savior is spelled with seven letters. And uh, could possibly be a reference to Jesus' perfection, all right, his deity. All right, uh, number three. And I try to spell Savior that way, too. I, I just think it's cool because that's the way the King James did it. But uh, <clears throat> number three, for talking about proving to you that Jesus is God in flesh by his names. He's called the true God. He's called the Savior. He's called the King of kings and Lord of lords. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Deuteronomy 10, 17. All right, Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. All right, so we see here that even in the Old Testament, uh, Jesus Christ is referred to as the Lord of lords. The Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. Jehovah is Lord of lords. There can only be one Lord of Lords. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. Revelation 19, 16. Only be one. Only be one Savior. Only can be one Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now I shared this verse with a Jehovah's Witness uh, uh, woman one day. She said, uh, well, Lord... Were you, I don't know if you were with me or not. Were you with me? Uh, but she said, uh, yeah, I know Jesus is called Lord, but she said it's always lowercase. So it's like just sir. Basically, they, she was saying it. They were just basically calling Jesus sir. 
I said, hold on now. Let's turn to Revelation 19, verse 16. Because I'll show you one that does better than just capitalize an L. It, it capitalizes everything. <laughs> Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. So uh, Revelation 17, 14. Let's see what that one says. Revelation 17, 14. And we see it again. For he is King of kings, Lord of lords and King of kings. Amen. Uh, now there can only be one King of kings. There can only be one Lord of lords. All right, turn to Manuel, or uh, I'm sorry, turn to uh, Ma Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew 1, 23. We see another name. We see uh, the, the name, the true God, the name Savior, King of kings, Lord of lords. Now let's look at this name in Matthew 1, 23, Emmanuel. Here's another good name that proves the deity of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, and it even tells us here what this means. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. All right, another name, the first and the last. Turn to Isaiah 44, 6. Another good name for Jesus that proves his deity. Isaiah... 44.6. Sorry, I lost my place. Isaiah 44.6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Now what does that remind you of? Now first of all, it says the Redeemer. We know Jesus is the Redeemer. But when it says, I am the first and the last, besides me there is no God, what does that remind you of? Can it remind you of Revelation chapter 1? Let's look at Revelation 1, where it says Jesus is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. He's the first and the last. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell on his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death, amen. Praise God, Jesus is the first and the last. Now, this verse says that the first and last was alive, then, I'm sorry, let me back up there, keep your place there in Revelation, uh, one, I'm sorry, uh, keep your, yeah, one, keep your place in Revelation, one. 17. Let's read that again. <clears throat> and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. This verse says, The first and the last was alive and then was dead, but is now uh, alive forevermore. Question. When did the Lord, when did Jehovah, when did uh, the God of the Old Testament die? He died on the cross. Amen. So it says here that the first and the last actually died. Amen. That's an awesome verse to prove the deed of Jesus Christ. He died on the old rugged cross. Jehovah was first and the last. Jehovah equals Jesus. Amen. Now, let's talk about some of his characteristics. We talked about proved by his names. We talked about a lot of his names. Just to review, true God, Savior, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Emmanuel, first and last. We saw a lot of those same names in the Old Testament. We're given to the same names. Uh, we're used for the same names to describe Jesus in the New Testament. Let's talk about some of his characteristics. Uh, proved by the fact that he is, he's omnipotent. All right, He has unlimited power. Matthew 28, 18. Matthew 28, 18, omnipotent. Some of these are big words that you hear a lot in churches. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresence, uh, omnipresent. Omnipotence means just he has unlimited power. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. How, I mean, if Jesus wasn't, wasn't God, then how could he have all power? 
Let's talk about his omniscience, the capacity to know everything. John 1, turn over to John 1, verse 48. John 1, 48, we'll see Jesus' omniscience, Jesus' capacity to know everything. But back up to verse 7. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, I'm an Israelite indeed, in whom there was no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when I... When thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said, un because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. All right, though bodily, though bodily removed from um, his presence, Jesus knew where Philip was. He saw him under a fig tree. Everybody get that? Everybody understand that? Jesus was bodily removed from Philip, but he knew where he was. He knew where he was under a fig tree. All right? So that just proves that Jesus is omniscient. All right? He's the capacity to know everything. He's all-knowing. Jesus is all-knowing. I'm not present. Let's look at his I'm not presence. Matthew 18, 20. Prove to you, and that's, that's kind of the problem that we have with, uh, you know, talking about a big fat man that lives in the North Pole, uh, you know, that gives presents and all that kind of stuff. Kind of the problem I have with him is the fact that you, you're making him out to be God. I mean, you're making him out to be all-knowing, everywhere, I'm not president. I mean, it seems like to me, I mean, I, I may be wrong, but, you know, it just seems like to me that should be a... a uh, some characteristics and some qualities that we should reserve for God Amen. and not attribute to some man. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm wrong here, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not big, up, big on Satan claws. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I know a lot of preachers who do, and they play around with and have a good time with their kids. And I, that's between you and the Lord, okay? That's between you and the Lord, but... I just always had a problem of lying to my kids. Number one, I just, I just didn't feel right about lying to my kids. You know, the, the same time I'm teaching my kids about God and Jesus, yeah, I'm also teaching about the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, and Santa Claus. When they grow up and they find out, okay, the Tooth Fairy was a lie, the Easter Bunny was a lie, Santa Claus was a lie, so was Jesus a lie too? Is that a big fairy tale too? I mean, think about it. All right, here, uh, all right, Matthew 18, 20. Hope some little kid in here doesn't go hang himself now. <laughs> you mean he's not real? <clears throat> all right, Matthew 18, 20. Hope I didn't ruin it for somebody, but. Matthew 18, verse 20. For if two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. So here we see God's omnipresence. He can be everywhere at one time. All right. <clears throat> the above three characteristics are only attributes of God and no other. All right. <clears throat> John chapter 1 verse 4. Proved by his characteristics. Let's see some more of his characteristics. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 1, 4. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus is the life. Uh, we're talking about his characteristics. He's life. Jesus is life. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right? We see he's omnipotent. He's omni om om omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's the life. He's the truth and the life. And he's immutable. Now, that's a pretty big word for a country boy like me. But immutable just means he never changes. All right? Only God never changes. Hebrews 13, 8. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Look at the fact that Jesus Christ never changes. Jesus Christ is saying, yesterday and today and forever. That's why, unless Jesus completely revoked it in the New Testament, we still follow it. We still go by it. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everybody wants to say, uh, you know, the God of the Old Testament was this wrathful, 
uh, terrible God, if you will, bloodthirsty God. And I was like, but the New Testament's different. Well, have you ever heard of Ananias and Sapphira? Have you ever read about what Jesus is going to do when he comes back in the book of Revelation? I mean, he's going to be more terrible then. then he, I, I see more bloodshed in Revelation than I see in the whole other Bible. I mean, when it's coming up to the horse's bridles, that's a lot of blood, my friend. That's in the New Testament. All right, so, uh, you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Prove, if we saw it's proved by his name, proved by his characteristics. Let's look at some of his works. Proved by his works. Isaiah 44. If you go back to Isaiah, it's right before Jeremiah. If you can go to Proverbs, sit in the middle of your Bible, write in Proverbs, Psalm Proverbs, and just go to the right a few. Uh, you'll run right into Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24. Proved by Jesus' works that Jesus, Jesus proved that he was God by his works. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by itself. Now it said he stretched forth the heavens alone. So did, 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 uh, did Jesus or the Lord of the Old Testament here in Isaiah 44, did he have any help? It says he did it alone, right? So... Whoever the, God, whoever the Lord of the Old Testament was here in Isaiah 44, who created the earth alone, he also has to be the same person who the New Testament says created the world. So let's see uh, in the New Testament who created the world. To go to Hebrews chapter 1. Here's something I want you to always remember. Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, John 1. Or... John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. Say that with me. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. The first chapter of John, the first chapter of Colossians, the first chapter of Hebrews all teach that Jesus created the worlds. They all teach the deity of Jesus Christ. And that's come in handy. I learned that as a young Christian. The first chapter out of those three books... Now, I couldn't necessarily remember what actually verse it was, but I remember somewhere in John 1, Hebrews 1, and Colossians 1 taught that Jesus created the world. And that will be very helpful for you when you try to explain the deity of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Hebrews 1 first. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1. Uh... All right, verse 2. <clears throat> hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. Jesus Christ made the worlds, friend. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1. Just go to your left. A few, pay, few uh, books there. Colossians. Right before Thessalonians. Colossians 1. Verse 15, who is the image, oh, let's back up to verse 14 so we know who we're talking about here. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. All things were created by Jesus Christ. When, when, when uh, God spoke and said, let there be light, that was Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ created the worlds with the power of his tongue. Now look at uh, John 1. Look at John chapter 1. Let's go to your left. Till you hit John 1, verse 10. And if you back up, you'll see the context here is talking about Jesus. But verse 10 specifically says, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. So tell me what three chapters, the first book, what, what, 
What are the three books that the first chapter of those books teach Jesus created the world? John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. Amen? Now, proved by his works, he created. Jesus proved he was God in the flesh because he created. He also proved because he forgave sin. Look at Luke 7, 48. Let's turn over uh, to the next chapter. In Luke 7, 48, and we're almost done. Luke 7, 48. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and skip through some of these. You'd be familiar with all these stories. Not only to forgive sin, but he raised from the dead. Not only did he raise from the dead, but he judge. He judges. Look at, uh, you probably might not be familiar with this one. John 5. Turn back over to John 5. Let's look at 27. John chapter 5, verse 27. And he hath given him authority to execute judgment, also because he is the Son of Man. So we see he forgives sin, he raises from the dead, he judges, he sends the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that a lot. I'm not going to go into that one. Jesus Christ actually sent the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's in uh, John 15, 26. But he was also proved by the worship that is given him. Now this is a big one right here. Turn to Hebrews 1. This is a very good one to share with Jeho Jehovah's Witnesses. Hebrews chapter 1, because Jehovah's Witnesses actually teach that Jesus Christ was an angel. They teach that Jesus Christ was Michael the archangel. So look here, we see angels worshiping Jesus. Now, don't you think the angels would get in trouble with God? Angels are only supposed to worship God, right? So don't you think the angels would be in some pretty hot water? Some deep kimchi? <laughs> if they were worshiping another angel... I think God would get... As a matter of fact, I think that's why some of them got cast out of heaven, right? Because they were worshiping Satan and following Satan. That's why... So, what would these angels that are still left in heaven... What would these angels that are stu, still servants of the true God... Why would they be worshiping another angel if Jesus was an angel? Look here at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Now, what the Jehovah's Witnesses did is they took their Bible and they changed that word from worship to like beseeched him, I think is what it says. Is that what it says? Do you remember on that? Beseeched him, basically it's like paid homage to him, just like respected him. They had to change their Bible, but you show them that King James, it says work, the angels of God worshipped him. So if Jesus was just an angel, these, these angels would be getting in big trouble with God, all right? Probably cast out of heaven, all right? All uh, right. He was worshipped by angels. He's worshipped by men. Look at Matthew chapter 14. Uh, we're almost done. I appreciate y'all hanging with me. Uh, you being good about there, Grayson. Proud of you, buddy. Uh, Matthew 14, verse 33. I, I really am. I, 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 I'm not bragging or nothing. I'm just, I'm the perfect pastor for a family integrated church. Because I get in a zone and I don't know what's going on, really. I mean, kids could be back and y'all probably, you know, that's why I asked like Brother Rod, you know, when we got visitors, keep an eye on these people. I need y'all's help because I get in a zone and, and, not, and stuff doesn't bother me. I've been in a lot of churches over the years where the pastors would actually call down kids. And, and you know, I will if they need, I mean, if they're being that... If they, if, if, if they get my attention, that means they're being really bad and they need to be called down. Because <laughs> I, I just, that's the kind of stuff that doesn't bother me. And uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. We, we want to try, we want to try to keep our, help our kids, train our kids to be the best they can be. Because we don't want to be distraction to others. But we also got to understand there's a training, there's training going on. Right? Our kids are in training. So that's why we need to be patient and we need to be loving and... Uh, as our, as our parents are training their kids. And let me say this. One of the best ways to train your kids is to sit them on a the couch at home and read them the Bible. Just start out with like a, two minutes. And then work it up to three minutes. Work it up to five minutes. And uh, it just, it'll, it'll teach them. But we're patient with our kids here. We're never, we're never going to call you out and embarrass you or anything like that. Unless it's really, really bad. I mean, I've been listening to Pastor Anderson for like, and he's pretty patient too. I've been listening to him for like, Seven or eight, nine years. I've only heard him had to call call a kid out like once or twice. I mean, they were screaming. 
And he was nice, and he gave the mother a warning. He's like, look, could you please, could you please take her to the, that's why we had this room over here. And she just refused. So she kept doing it, kept doing it. He finally had to call her out. But, you know, we try to be patient because we're all, all our kids are learning, all our kids are growing. Uh, Matthew 14, 33. Uh, then, they, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. So we see men worshiping Jesus Christ. This is a great verse to give to Jehovah's Witnesses uh, and uh, Mormons. Now, here's one of my favorites, John 20, 28. John 20, 28. You would know the story when the disciples, some of them told Thomas that uh, they saw the resurrected Christ. Thomas didn't believe him. That's, why he got, that's how he got the name Doubting Thomas. And he basically said, I'm not going to believe it until I see it and actually touch his flesh, touch the nail holes in his hands, touch his side. I'm not going to believe it until I'm actually able to touch him and see him. So Jesus came to him while they were... Uh, uh, fellowshipping, and, and he actually, the Bible says the door was shut, and he walked through the door. So Jesus is in, is in his glorified body here. But it says in verse 27, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered, said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now, if Jesus was just an angel, he would have, uh, he would have rebuked. An angel would rebuke somebody for calling them God or Lord because they wouldn't want to receive that kind of honor or that kind of glory. But he doesn't rebuke them. Look what he says. He receives it. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. All right, so he's not rebuking them at all. He's receiving it. And uh, Philippians 2.10, let's look at Philippians 2.10. See, one of the good things I encourage, like some of these preacher boys that are wanting to go into the ministry, is to have a, a little stockpile of sermons. Because this is something I preached years ago. And I had it available to me today because I got it at 1 o'clock last night. You know, I just had to polish it up a little bit during lunch. So that's why one of the best things you can do to be a preacher boy is, uh, you know, in addition to reading through the Bible four times a year, you know, and, uh, you know, learn at the foot of your pastor. Go ahead and start developing some sermons. So you have some things you can fall back on. This is, I was able to fall back on this because, you know, like I said, I got in real late last night. So uh, where are we at? Philippians 2.10. All right. <clears throat> that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under earth. Okay, so the whole world, every, every knee that's ever been born. I mean, every person alive that's ever been born, all right, one day is going to bow to knee and worship Jesus Christ. All right, so he's going to be, he's, he's worshiped by angels, he's worshiped by men, he's worshiped by Thomas, and one day he's going to be worshiped by all. Amen? Now, no way an angel or anybody that was not God would be worshiped by all. Now, Jesus is also proved with equality in the Trinity. Uh, we won't go into all these, but... Uh, He's equal with the Father. John 14, 23 says he's equal to the Father. Uh, John 10, 30, if you want to look it up later. Uh, he's also equal with the Father in the Spirit. And uh, so Jesus is equal with the Trinity. Let's see. <clears throat> Tell you what, we got, we got time. Let's look at, let's look at one of these. Uh, let's look at Matthew 28, 18. Matthew 28:18 I'm sorry, 28:19 Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You know, <clears throat> he's equal. We see it the command is given equal there. 
the, the Trinity is, 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 is uh, this being displayed here is equal three and one. They're all equal. We'll look at another one. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Here we see it again. Uh, being displayed or pictured here in all these. The three and one are equal. It says verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. He's listing all three there. Um, so as a review, what three chapters teach the deity of Christ? John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. Amen. Lastly, let me give you this in closing. He's proved by the only way to be saved. All right, Jesus is proved by the only way to be saved. God doesn't change, nor has his means of being saved has changed. All right, Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ is proved to be God by the only way, because he's the only way to be saved. All right, Lord, you were saved by calling on the name of the Lord in Genesis. You're still saved today by calling on the name of the Lord in Romans 10. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament are the same requirements. If there's only one Lord and you have to call upon His name, what is it? Jesus. All right. In the Old Testament, they look to uh, the coming Lord. Today, we look back at what our Lord did. Amen. Now, in closing, no one can disprove His existence. Nobody can just, you know, they, they, may, they may want to try to disprove that Jesus actually walked the face of this earth, but they can't. His, it's written in his, uh, history books. You know, it's the calendar system is based off the fact that Jesus walked the face of this earth. No one can disprove his existence. M many write him off as just being a son of God. Some write him off as being just a teacher or a good prophet or just a moral man. But with the claims that came out of Jesus' mouth, what Jesus claimed out of his own mouth, you've only got three choices about Jesus. Many say he was a teacher. Many say he was just a prophet. Many say he was just a, a good moral person. But the claims that came out of Jesus' mouth, everybody's got to put Jesus in one of three categories. He was either the biggest liar that's walked the face of the earth. He was either a deranged lunatic like David Koresh, or he was Lord. Amen. We know he was Lord. He's proved to us that he's Lord. Amen. Now... <clears throat> Tell you what, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll close and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt something here that I've never done before. But let's go ahead and close and we'll have a word of prayer.